Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see uh, friends and faces and so many joining us to, tonight for this um, webinar of the Daniel Berrigan Collective with Freedom, Frida Berrigan on the fast that matters. Uh, the Berrigan Collective was begun several years ago to promote the person, thought, action, legacy of Daniel Berrigan using a variety of media, including webinars. And uh, we've done a string of those which are uh, available. The recordings of those are available on the website. We, we don't really have interest in nostalgia, um, Dan, but the, the collective comes out of the tradition that he promoted, which in which contemplation and reflection and study flow into and out of uh, community action and resistance. And to that end, uh, I want to begin uh, in a contemplative fashion with a couple of, of Dan's poems fit for uh, Latin themes of human mortality and the yearning for God. Um, the first one is from the Block Island book. Uh, and the second, uh, well, I pulled it from uh, The Trouble with Our State. And I read them together kind of uh, because they, they seem to echo and uh, answer one another. So the first from Block Island. Drinking one night, we talked the moon down. Think of mad racers we're at the mercy of and stuttering engines of aircraft so high the guardian angels peel away. Then street knifings and bloody so on, it's certain we exist courtesy of bellicose junkers by merest sufferance. Significant death, gold leaf of history, cosmetic on a split skull. And this one called Miracles. Where I, God Almighty, I would ordain rainfall lightly where old men trod. Hello. Hi. No death in childbirth, neither infant nor mother. Ditches firm fenced against the errant blind. Aircraft come to ground like a feather. No mischance, malice, knives, tears dried would resolve all flaw and blockage of mind that makes us mad, sets lives awry. So I pray under the sign of the world's murder, a ruined son, why are you silent? Feverish as lions, hear us in the world, caged, devoid of hope. Still, some redress and healing the hand of an old woman turns gospel page. It flares up gentle, the sudden tears of Christ. Tonight we're fortunate and, and then some to have with us uh, Frida Berrigan, who wrote the meditations for uh, this year's uh, Pax Christi Lenten book, called A Fast That Matters. A couple members of the Berrigan Collective Steering Committee, Kathy O'Leary and John Noble, are uh, connected with uh, Pax Christi and uh, uh, bring that connection. Uh, other folks, uh, other members of the current steering committee are Anna Brown, who's on, and perhaps Ryan DeCorpo. Just a quick uh, word about uh, format and how we'll proceed. Uh, we'll invite Frida to share some reflections uh, and then hope for perhaps half an hour for conversation and questions. In that connection, um, certainly for the moment, please stay muted. Uh, but if you want to uh, put questions as, as we go in the in the chat, we'll try to gather those into the into the process of uh, conversation. Uh, 
Uh, there's a couple of announcements that we'll have at the end, and we actually have a hard stop at 7.45 tonight uh, because we'll in be inviting you into a, uh, an action conversation for those who are willing and able at 8 p.m. I think that's preliminaries. Uh, I, I think most everyone uh, on the on the call tonight knows uh, of Frida Berrigan. Uh, she lives in New London, Connecticut with her husband and three kids. She's an urban farmer and community activist, organizing around affordable home ownership with uh, the Southeast, Southeastern Connecticut Community Land Trust and the ever-stretching shadow of militarism with the Connecticut Committee on Nuclear Prohibition. She writes periodically for Waging Nonviolence, Tom, Dits, Tom Dispatch, and In These Times, and is the author of the 2015 book, which I hope you know, it runs in the family on being raised by radicals and growing into rebellious motherhood. Thanks so much for being with us, Frida. Uh, it's really a, a gift and a joy. And uh, for the next bit, we'll put ourselves in your hands. Thanks. Um, well, I don't know if anybody really wants to put themselves in my hands, you know, um, <laughs> but uh, but thank you. Um, I thought that I would, um, I'm re really happy to be here and be with the, the 43 of uh, you who are in uh, little boxes um, in front of me. Um, I've been asked to read a couple of reflections from uh, Pax Christie's uh, Lenten book, The Fast That Matters. Um, and I'll, I'll do that in a couple of minutes. But I, I want to start uh, by acknowledging uh, the Nahantic, the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, and the Eastern Pequot peoples. The traditional caretakers of this land uh, where I am uh, here in New London, Connecticut. I honor and pay respects to these tribes, their ancestors, their lineage, um, who today uphold traditional practices, art, and education uh, here in our area. We read a version uh, of this land acknowledgement each Sunday at All Souls Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Um, and uh, in, in reading it and in having crafted it, are in active and reciprocal dialogue uh, with these indigenous communities, some of which are federally recognized and some of which uh, don't have that, um, don't have that set of benefits or that, or that set of complications, uh, maybe is a better way uh, of saying it, um, and, and actively grapple with how to live into um, and honor and respect uh, this land acknowledgement. You know, these sorts of land acknowledgements have been kind of, have become kind of de rigueur, right? Like that they're, they're done. Um, uh, so in, in certain circles, often enough to feel sort of rote and, um, and all of that. But uh, interestingly, I went to mass uh, yesterday um, at our uh, local Catholic congregation, St. Mary's of the Sea, to get my ashes on. Um, and uh, there was no such uh, land acknowledgement as, as part of the Catholic mass at St. Mary's. And uh, I don't uh, think that there's a land acknowledgement at our other Catholic congregation here in New London, St. Joseph's. So I'm just, I'm just sort of, you know, in my own mind sort of uh, flagging that um, and, and curious uh, about, about it. I mention it here. Um, so, I'm happy to be with all of you in this holy season, this holy season of atonement and preparation. Um, I felt wholly, with a W, wholly ill-suited uh, for the task given to me by Pax Christi um, to write um, all of these reflections, um, uh, 40 days, actually more than 40 days, because uh, you know I write about Easter too, um, but I, I was also uh, deeply honored uh, uh, by by the invitation, and um, and and found uh, myself a very um, thought that I really loved uh, writing all of these reflections. I was blown away by how much I I loved doing it, and um, and so 
uh, and surprised uh, by um, uh, some of what uh, came up. Um, so, uh, so I'm really grateful to Patricia for inviting me to do it and for creating um, such a lovely uh, booklet um, out of uh, what I put together. I thought I'd read two uh, reflections um, and then uh, and then open it up for a conversation. If there's not a ton of conversation, I'll uh, read one more. Um, my favorite, I think, is it okay to have a favorite? Um, uh, which is uh, the Ash Wednesday one, uh, yesterday's. Um, I didn't want to start with that in case everybody's just basically reading along and has already, um, you know, already did that one. <clears throat> so, um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, the first Sunday of Lent, which is, you know, coming right up. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, um, each one of the reflections is uh, built around, um, you know, a line uh, or a couple lines uh, that stood out to me from uh, the readings of, of that day. So, um, the, the, the gospel reading uh, for the first Sunday of Lent is Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Um, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So uh, so that's the, the text that I'm uh, in real in relationship with. These reflections are pecked out on a 20 year old laptop, written on the back of my kids' drawings and along the edges of half checked off to-do lists. Some of the ideas here came to me while I weeded the garden, finished a jog, folded laundry, um, which it looks like that's what um, Aaron and uh, Lydia are doing um, while we're, <laughs> so, so my best ideas come while I'm folding laundry. Um, or spacing out in the car behind a school bus, making many stops. But most of these ideas came to me while I was doing the daily readings with my mom. Liz McAllister celebrated her 84th birthday in November of 2023. The powerful community builder, theologian, nonviolent resistor now lives in the present tense of dementia and lives beautifully. Her grace, gratitude, and wit are still firmly implanted. These reflections came out of my late adoption of the ancient Lectio Divina practice, where the word of God is read aloud around a circle, with each person singling out a word or phrase that speaks to them, speaks to their lives, and speaks to the lives of the whole circle. I came home to this daily practice during the pandemic crouched in front of an iPod, propped up on a precarious stack of books, volume all the way up to help Liz McAllister connect with friends. My sister Kate came up with this brilliant plan, but none of us could have predicted what a lifeline it would become for all of us. We gathered some of Liz's besties from around the country for an hour of daily prayer and Bible reflection. We gathered in response to twin distancing, twin distance scenes, the COVID distancing restrictions and the growing distance within Liz's mind between the present and her own memory. Our friends logged in from New Jersey and New York and Georgia and North Carolina. We'd catch up and chat for a few minutes and then get down to the business of breathing new meaning into 2000 year old words. Liz was always ready to move from chit chat to the word and work of God. On Sundays, we added bread and wine and a song or two. Sometimes we said the rosary. Sometimes it went on for more than an hour and a half. Sometimes it was just half an hour. Sometimes there were dozens of little Zoom boxes and sometimes there were just two or three. For hours afterwards, Liz would reach for the friends reach for the friend she saw on the computer, trying to get behind the little pictures to the concrete presence of her dearest friends. We got a large text subscription to give us this day. And for a long time, Liz could read with us. Then the words stopped making sense on the page and she listened to the rest of us read. But the words kept making sense in her heart and mind. They keep making sense today. 
dementia has taken her memory, has taken her past, has taken some of her visual and spatial processing, which makes her increasingly tentative as she moves through space. But dementia has not taken her faith. This ghastly disease has not taken the rhythm of the gospels or the lyricism of the Psalms from her. She still finds solace in the conspiracy of prayer, the collective meditative silence that entreats and implores, centering the orphan, the widow, the outsider, the outsider, the penitent. We would offer prayers of the faithful at the end of our reflection, and sometimes they would go on for dozens of minutes, and sometimes would tread towards gossip. How hungry we were, uh, how hungry we all were for gossip back then. But Liz never gossiped. Almost every day she would offer this prayer. We pray for those who are lonely, that they may have a visitation that lifts their spirits and reminds them that they are loved. Liz's prayer became my refrain. 2020, 2021, 2022 was a time when so many were so isolated, when the endemic loneliness of capitalism had cemented into the endless loneliness of the pandemic. We had to be alone to be safe, but being alone was so inhuman. Other people are a source of contagion, but they are also the reason to keep living. <clears throat> this Lenten image of Jesus alone in the desert, seeking solitude, looking for inner strength and resolve, tempted by the devil, accompanied by wild beasts, ministered to by angels. This Lenten image speaks to me about dementia and loneliness and pandemic. Who are we in the story? Are we Jesus? Are we Satan? Are we a wild beast or an angel? How I wish to be an angel in this story. And how deeply I know that in this story, my mother is Jesus. So, um, so that was the the first uh, the the offering for the first Sunday of Lent, um, and then I I wanted to skip all the way to the end um, if it doesn't uh, feel like a spoiler to you, um, and, and read the reflection uh, that I offer for Easter, um, which is uh, um, so I'll, I'll, so I'll do that. Because you're all muted, you can't tell me. Don't spoil the ending. Um, okay, so the the line that I'm uh, that I'm uh, focused on here um, is this: On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. <clears throat> and here is my reflection. Here we are, finally arriving on Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. Like a lot of people, I have a complicated relationship with the Catholic Church. The maleness, the hierarchy, the violence towards the vulnerable, the secrecy, all that property, as my dad would say, property. All that property. The blessing and or silence on U.S. war making and nuclearism. All that ornateness. My complicated relationship is made slightly more complicated by the fact that my parents were a nun and a priest and fell in love and were pushed out of their vocations. As I've grown older, I've learned that we, the children of nuns and priests, are our own little subculture. Both of my sisters-in-law, Karen and Molly, are the daughters of clergy, and we tend to find one another in the world. That rela uh, relationship wrinkle is made even deeper by the depth of grace, wisdom, and courage that my parents found in the Jonah House liturgy and the Bible study circles far from the institutional 
far from the institutional church. So I was raised by two people who grew up with the Latin mass, who literally spoke Latin, who were educated in the church and went on to educate within the church, but raised their three kids outside of the strictures of the Catholic, of the capital C Catholic church. My parents were steeped enough in the church to sometimes be surprised by the gaps in our religious education. What do you mean you don't know the rosary? My mother asked me one time. You never taught me the rosary, mom, I replied. They forgot that we needed to be taught things like that. I know the rosary now. I learned it uh, during a five-day fast and vigil to close the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay. I learned the rosary in Cuba, as it happens, as witness against torture prayed for the Muslim men imprisoned and tortured there. My husband and I are raising our own kids in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, a good place for a Catholic and an atheist to find solace, community, and fellowship. But I now find myself exclaiming in some of the same ways my parents did uh, about their very ecumenical, very wholesome, and very de-Christological faith formation. I find myself saying to my kids, what do you mean you don't know what the Trinity is? I'll give you an example. The Berrigans, my dad and his brothers, Jerry, Dan, and Jim, love to get together and tell jokes. Most of these jokes were religious and body. But a favorite was told best by our friend Ellen Grady. Um, and I hope she's not here because I'm about to say something um, about her, I, her her Italian accent not being so good. So if anybody knows Ellen on this call, just shh. Um, the joke involves three mafia guys who die and are sent to heaven by mistake. There, they get a second, they get a chance at a second chance. If they could tell St. Peter what Easter is, they get to stay in heaven. The first and second guys can't tell them what Easter is. They botch their exclamation, explanations, they get Easter confused with other holidays, and they get sent to hell. The third guy seems like he's going to get into heaven because he's describing Jesus' passion and crucifixion very well. And then he gets to the part where Jesus comes out of the tomb. And he says, after three days, if he see his shadow, he go back down for six or more weeks. It never fails. It's this great joke. It's a great joke. My kids love it when I tell this joke. I have more of like kind of a Northern Italian slash Norwegian, maybe like a little like Lower East Side kind of accent. Um, but they're not Catholic. And so they don't know what the passion and the crucifixion story uh, they don't know that story very well. My daughter, Madeline, will laugh and laugh and laugh. I don't get it, she says, with tears running down her face. I don't get it. I love it, but I don't get it. I love it, but I don't get it. I love it, but I don't get it. It could sum up how the disciples are feeling at the tomb in this reading, right? The resurrection I love it, but I don't get it. The passage from John's gospel is full of the disciples' uncertainty. Mary tells the other disciples, they have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. One of the disciples runs to the tomb, peers in to see the burial clothes, but does not go in. And then there's the concluding line. For they do not yet understand the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Mary of Magdala, Simon Peter, John, the other disciples, they love Jesus. They have walked this long journey with him. They have heard over and over again that this would end with this moment, this vindication of life over death, this resurrection. And here they are present to it, and they do not get it. Do we get it? Do we get it? Do, do we understand?
We know it's not the empire's theology of a white, muscular Jesus who triumphs and who will save a select few. Jesus' resurrection in our world today means that we are alive again too. Our fast is over. And now, renewed by our Lenten rituals, we go forth hungry. Hungry for good things to fill our bellies, maybe. But more than that, hungry for good works to fill our aching world with love. Our aching world with love, compassion, justice, and beauty. I thought there was one more little part to that, but there's not. I'm just going to read that last line again because I was looking for the next page. Right? Hungry for good things to fill our bellies, maybe. But more than that, hungry for good works to fill our aching world with love, compassion, justice, and beauty. It's fun to skip ahead uh, to the end, right? And uh, go straight for the resurrection. Um, you just go from the first Sunday of Lent uh, to resurrection. Um, and that would be, that would be really, really nice. But, um, but in, in practice, we, we can't, right? We're, we're on day two uh, of this long Lenten season. Um, and it's good to be together with you all. So I hope I've given enough time uh, for uh, some discussion um, or I can, or I can read one more, but I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I'll remind people that uh, we said we would use the chat to collect some uh, comments and uh, questions. Uh, but I'm if I'm going to take a prerogative if it's okay and uh, make a little uh, comment, maybe a question of my own as well. Um, the collective's done a couple of recent webinars on uh, icon painters, though traditionally they they say they write an icon, and I I've confessed that I've I read ahead <laughs> I read ahead to the end, and in, in, in fact. Uh, I'm committed to using this uh, this your meditations uh, through the season, uh, but I also scoped them out. Um, and uh, the first one that you read for the for the first Sunday in Lent, uh, I feel like you and there's another the second Sunday, which is also really focused on Liz, and she's reprised again and. Monday, Thursday. Uh, I feel like you've written, found and offered uh, Liz as a kind of living icon for Lent. Um, and I sort of want to commend her that way as a, an image of humanity and mortality and uh, I was going to say frailty, though I'm not sure that's exactly right. But, but more so in the the process of age and dementia is kind of stripping down uh, to the heart, transfigured to, as you suggest, her essential who-ness, you know, and her faith. And uh, and I think you're, it offers us an opportunity to pray with her that prayer that that you read and. Uh, which is also about visitation, which is also about you and uh, Kate and Jerry's care uh, of her. Anyway, and I, I would also confess I, I had her in mind in, the, in one of the opening poems where the woman's hand turns the gospel page and it flares up with Christ's tears. Uh, so that's my comments. <laughs> uh, the, and maybe another but also with a question under it is uh, uh, I, was, I was struck I don't know maybe I'm wrong but I don't think you mentioned the word nonviolence uh, in the course of the book but uh, it just it feels like everything uh, it's partly the passages I think that uh, light up for you uh, for, um, among the choices uh, you know, who were the foes before whom the Lord sets 
a table in their presence, uh, uh, go and be reconciled, forgive 70 times seven with Madeline and, and Seamus uh, and their ritual, fasting from empire and domination, the image of the king and Jonah and the whole people and nation repenting, uh, love of enemies. This, it seems like uh, you just keep coming at uh, the text with an eye and an ear for uh, what can be named as as nonviolence. Uh, and I wonder how much that's a, a, a literary and spiritual strategy, or if it's just who you are and what lights up and uh, uh, just flows that way for you. That's a question. Is that true? <laughs> Which of those are, are something else? Cool. Wait, uh, that, that's the question? No. Uh, yeah. um, okay, sure. Uh, um, well, or, or your mom to either. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think I... You know, so so I I want to say that I wrote this. I, I think my deadline was November first um, uh, for putting all of this uh, together, right? So it was you know kind of written during Advent uh, for Lent. Um, uh, but uh, and I, and I had had uh, Liz in mind, um, you know, uh, when I said yes, I was like, oh well, like I'm saying less yes because of because of Liz, because this will sort of, you know, um, give me a, a, a project that I can kind of do in the, you know, in the margins of, of taking care of her. Um, but, but I do think that, um, that I have found kind of a whole new dimension to, um, to my Catholicism in seeing, um, seeing how um how deeply embedded uh, the word of god um is uh, for her um you know she's she's not all always able to summon uh, my name uh, for example um or connect my voice and my face uh with uh with uh with daughter right um but um uh, but she can correct my pronunciation um of uh you know some of the place names in the Hebrew scriptures, and uh, she can uh, define uh, terms uh, for me, and um, and uh, and uh, fill in the line at the end of a sentence if I happen to pause um, by accident or, or on purpose. And so um, I am, you know, just kind of deeply moved by um, by by that and how. You know, you know everything about our society and our culture tells us that when you stop producing, uh, you cease to have a, a, an identity within uh, within our economy, right? Um, and uh, it's been a long time since Liz, uh, you know, produced. Um, and that when you forget, uh, you kind of like, you know, uh, are losing your humanity. Right. And um, and so this, you know, of course, I I I would re I reject that kind of um, diminishment, uh, uh, this ageism uh, there. A and yet, um, yet it's this very powerful force within our within our society. And um, and this common language of of the readings of the Lectio Divina, um, you know, keeps me very tied not just to the person she was, um, but the but the person and the presence that she uh, continues to be, um, and it, uh, you know, uh, it's a daily reminder of uh, the the personhood of 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 every person, um, and, and maybe that kind of you know can connect to um, to sort of. Uh, your identification bill that like, well, the word nonviolence isn't kind of front and center in these, uh, you know, 40 pages, um, that it's kind of all the way through, woven all the way through, 
right? And and kind of this this inherent worth and dignity of, of each person, as we say, within Unitarian Universalism, uh, you know, being um, kind of all we need to know, right? The, the, all, the only reason we need to have to be um, against Israeli bombardment of, of, of Gaza, right? Um, uh, against uh, violence uh, of any kind, against any person. Um, and I, I kind of, one of my challenges in, in writing this was writing it as, as uh, you know, uh, uh, October 7th and, uh, and Hamas's attack um, and then uh, Israeli response was all, you know, very fresh. And, and yet, you know, I kept thinking, well, it's going to be over really soon. Right. And um, to not write with too much specificity um, about a, a, a conflict that I, you know, fully expected would, but how how wrong how wrong I was right here we are you know five five six months into it um, but there was one particular moment right when um, I think in uh, November or early December uh, when uh, a, an Israeli incursion uh, to free hostages being held by Hamas you know resulted in the the death of of uh, I think three members of, of the Israeli defense forces by their own people friendly fire incidents and it was this moment where I really felt like kind of you know screaming and pulling my hair out and you know going out into the street in um in uh sackcloth and ashes and and just being like this is the this is the logic of this is the logic of war this is what war war does uh war uh, uh you know creates the conditions where you know we kill our side and um and then we we double you know uh we triple quadruple down on that loss right the fallacy of sunk costs uh as it's uh is called in economic circles um you know at the time i was uh, teaching a class uh, at connecticut college and i would just kind of come into class and just be like the war is just so bad <laughs> and they were like yeah, you're so excited, Frida. Um, you know, they called me uh, Dr. Bear again, even though I, I don't have a, I have no kind of degree. But, um, but just the the, the futility um, uh, uh, of it all. Um, if I'm, I'm not speaking about the the specifics of uh, U.S. Uh, support uh, for uh, the Israeli military and the Israeli government. Um, to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Uh, I'm not talking specifically in a specific way um, about uh, kind of the, the daily uh, crime against humanity uh, unfolding um, in Gaza. It, it really wasn't, I'm sort of ashamed to say it, right? It really was like, well, I want this to be kind of evergreen. And I, I feel like, you know, there were, there were early indications that this would you know that the ceasefire would would continue and carry on and uh anyway um kind of looking looking back at it uh now um just just wanting to say that you know war is is always a, a crime against humanity that it's always a failure of the imagination um and, and wanting to uh breathe so much imagination into um into this, into this season of Lent, uh, to invite us uh, to an imagination and to, 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 to be on a, a strict, uh, no empire diet, right? A strict, uh, no bloodletting, uh, no vengeance, um, uh, no indiscriminate bombing uh, diet, um, along with our eschewing of chocolate or ice cream or, you know, whatever sort of a random thing we've chosen to uh, to give up for Lent. Um, that uh, if if every Catholic in this country uh, decided to fast from empire uh, for this Lent, uh, what a different uh, what a different Easter we could be celebrating um, with our with our brothers and sisters uh, throughout the world, particularly with brothers and sisters in in, in Gaza and in.
So I'm sure that didn't answer your question, Bill, but uh, that that's what came up. Com for me. Completely and perfectly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I had Mary Grace put a comment. Uh, and this goes back to your mom uh, in the in the chat. Maybe I'll Mary Grace, if you want to just come unmute and and uh, engage that with with Frida. Sure. Hi, Frida. What a gift to see you. <laughs> uh, I keep thinking about being pregnant at the same time your mom was pregnant with Kate. <laughs> Uh, so I wrote, I keep thinking about your mom, Frida, and how she lives in the present. We push little kids to grow up, act responsibly, don't be childish, et cetera. And then we spend most of our adulthood trying to get back to that place of living in the present. I sadly do understand because of Sebastian's last year, and I don't diminish the very real difficulties and pain and passing. But I wonder what each of us can learn from these hard realities for our own day to day. Thank you, uh, Mary Grace. Thank you so much. And uh, Sebastian Graber. Presente. Presente. Um, I would uh, I would have this, um, I would be on a walk with my mom and uh, it would be kind of like distracted. We would be having the same conversation. We were like, we were kind of talking about the thing again, whatever it was. Um, and I would, you know, I would be kind of like, oh, here we go again, you know. And then I would kind of give myself this smack across the face. And I would say, you know, Frida, to myself in my, I wasn't talking out loud to myself, smacking myself out, out loud, really. But I would give myself this little smack and I would say, you know, you're going to miss this. This is not, this is not going to continue to happen this feels endless in this moment and but it's not going to continue to happen and you're going to miss it so so just enjoy it just be present in it and so her my mom's occupation of the present you know was an invitation to also live in the present and and you're right mary grace we you know uh, kids are in a, a rush to uh, grow up and we're in a rush to, you know, have them hit maturity. Um, and then, you know, but nobody wants to be 50. <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody wants to, um, uh, you know, and then like our adult lives are, man, they're long and uh, man, they're full of lots of responsibility. Um, but um, so, so this, this call to be present to the present, um, it is a, it's a discipline, um, and, and a gift. And, uh, and I, I now, you know, Liz is not going for long walks anymore. Our conversations are less, um, you know, coherent and reciprocal than they were a year ago when I was being impatient. And I do miss those times, right? I do miss those long walks. Uh, during the pandemic, sometimes we would walk seven miles a day, you know, four times a day. We just head out there going for another walk, um, cutting onions for hours. Right. And um, and now, you know, she struggles to, uh, um, you know, use a use a fork or a spoon independently. And um, and so there's a there's a slowing down and, and I'm I'm slowing down with her and Kate is slowing down with her being present to that. And then also thinking to myself, as I sat with her today, um, I'm going to miss this. I'm going to miss this, right? This is, this is not, this is not forever. And I, you know, it's, it's not even going to be that long, right? Um, so, uh, so we're called to be in the present and, um, and uh, nothing about, you know, kind of late capitalism or, uh, or uh, living in empire, none of, like, we're not encouraged in any way uh, to live in the present uh, by, by kind of the dominant society, right? Um, we're we're uh, encouraged to aspire 
and uh, and kind of you know wish for retirement or you know kind of um, like look to the future or kind of look back to the past and the halcyon days. You know, my like my football career as a junior in high school, right? Um, because if we're in the present and fully inhabiting this present reality, we are not good consumers, right? And we are treasuring uh, like a, a, a word that a world that's under assault. Um, and we are, you know, fighting uh, to build climate resiliency and we're resisting uh, a war that, you know, makes a future impossible. Um, and so um, there's something very radical uh, about living in the present and, and just being right here, right now. Um, and, uh, and so I'm deeply grateful to, you know, be called on a, on a daily basis and, and called like on a molecular level um, to, to, to just be, to just be in the present. Thank you. We're going to keep the uh, uh, chat open for uh, questions and, and comments as time allows, but I for one to hear I for one want to hear your favorite uh, uh, reflection that you're holding uh, holding to to provide. You're muted. Here we go. Here we go. Ash Wednesday. Um, and the the uh, um. The verse that I, I chose here was uh, return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. And I'll just say before I start to read that I um, read this to Liz yesterday and I started crying. I just cried and cried and cried. I was reading it. Um, and just kind of tears were pouring down my face as I read it. And she was like, um, she was like, it's very repetitive. I, you know, don't, I'm, I'm done with this. We don't need to hear this anymore. This is repetitive. And I was like, well, it's poetry, mom. It's, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, repetitive. Like it's, you know, it's, it, it comes from an oral tradition, and so it had to be kind of repetitive because it was memorized and passed down. And she was just like, no. And I'd like to think uh, that she didn't want, she didn't understand why I was crying and didn't, you know, want me to cry. And so wanted me to kind of move on to, to something, something more cheerful. So anyway, that was just a little aside. Return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. So here's my reflection. My forehead feels like a Vegas billboard ringed in neon. The small black cross itches and tingles and almost pulses as I try to go about my day. At every turn, I feel a strange and slightly uncomfortable kinship with anyone else bearing the humble cross across their forehead, the white man in a striped and requisite tie, the black woman with a bright scarf, the Latina dressed for the gym, the young hipster wearing a designer t-shirt. We are members of the same club. There's eye contact, recognition, and an almost smile, smile or awkward happy Ash Wednesday. But this is not a happy time. The mark of the cross is meant to stand in for our torn garments and our sackcloths of atonement. Imagine wearing that to work today. That itchy smudge is an outward symbol of our inward commitment to repentance throughout this Lenten season. This year, let's not reduce Lent to just another faddish diet, faddish diet, veneered by piety, or a self-care ego trip with lots of loud proclaiming. 
God doesn't need our simulacra of suffering or our ostentatiously torn garments. God needs us back. God needs our whole and broken hearts. God needs our full attention. Our blood-soaked, plastic-choked, smog-blocked creation needs our full attention. That is God. We fast as though it matters. Our fast matters. We fast from war making, from empire, from plastic, from vengeance, from empty rhetoric, from despair. By giving all of that up, we pray and act as though we're making room for holy anger, holy tears, holy change, holy peace. Lent begins again this time on the secular ch chocolate fest of Valentine's Day. On this day of love, we return to you, O oh God. I kind of want to ask just for a moment of silence almost, yeah. Thanks for inviting us. So <clears throat> I'm just seeing Mary Grace has uh, put in another reflection. Do you want to do you want to speak to it, Mary Grace, rather than me reading it? Sure. I just as you were talking, Frida, it made me think of um, um, I know you all have so graciously yeah, I mean, it's just been such a gift to watch you and your family engage with, with your wonderful mom. Um, my mom didn't like my mother-in-law didn't like me, <laughs> so I wrote. I wrote. There is a gift in this decline sometimes. So my mother-in-law just passed away. Nicholas, Jenica Rose, and I are heading out to Cheyenne, Wyoming, for sun on Sunday for the burial. She judged me harshly for all those political class and other reasons. She also judged her son, <laughs> to whom I was married, very harshly. Um, but in her dementia, she forgot that. She forgot that she didn't like me. She softened and she was so sweet with us when we spent time together in December. And so there was a healing and an honor in that transformation for me and I, I believe for her also. Thank you. I see lots of appreciations uh, uh, happening in the... Uh, in the chat, but also uh, Kathleen, you have your hand raised and invite you to speak up. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Kathleen. I don't know where I am or what this is, but I'm just so happy I found myself here. I met, I met, I'm a teacher. I met my um, parent teacher night and um, here I am at this wonderful gathering. And I've been like having parents come in and I'm just like, you know, chatting with them a little bit on the side and telling other parents where to go. And um, I'm so grateful that I found <laughs> myself at this gathering. And um, as a Catholic, a very complicated Catholic um, who wanted to do something for Lent, that's how I found myself here. Um, but I didn't know what, and I'm sort of an embarrassed Catholic. Like I don't want people to know that I'm Catholic kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and you know, I have five siblings who walk around with their ashes huge and like, they love their ashes. My sister in Georgia, um, she was just in the hospital for kidney stones, but she found out that there was a drive through ashes, um, place. So she was so psyched to like, get like supersized ashes through the drive through. <laughs> and, um, so we all thought that was really funny, but, um, I'm just so moved. And I just want to thank everybody. Cause I feel like I found my people cause I'm a comrade and, um, <laughs> This is so, this is just so good. And um, we, my siblings and I, we lost our mom to Parkinson's and dementia um, a year ago last week. And that what Mary Grace was just talking about really resonated as well. Um, my mom was really difficult, like personality disordered and really tough and caring for her in her illness um, when she became a nice person, <laughs> um, even before she became a nice person, like we had to, 
care for her um, and had to find the grace to care for her um, was such a gift. And um, she became like a child. And it was, it was just this interesting, more than interesting, it was this healing gift. It, it was the grace that we all needed um, because she got the love that she, I think, never got as a child. So it was really special. So this, it, it was, it's wonderful. So it's wonderful to hear these stories. And I just thank everybody. I feel like I'm going on and on, but um, when this is over, I'm going to like find out what this all is and get this book and look you up. So yay, thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> um, we would, uh, we want to make a, uh, a couple of pitches here at the end. Uh, I think first I'll, in, we want to invite both John and then Kathy uh, to, to make some comments and pitches. John, are you, I know you're doing child care. Are you ready to go? I'm here. You're oh, up. Give me one second. Um, can we have Kathy go first and then go me? Sure. Uh, right. Light baby. Absolutely. Instead. Right yep. on cue. Kathy. All right. Um, yes. So, um, and and I so I want to take a moment to thank thank you, Frida. Um, uh, and I was so excited to hear that you were writing the the Lenten reflections this year. Um, I I really love reading your writing. I love listening to you speak. Um, uh, and um, and actually, I got to write a very small part of the Lenten Reflections last year. Um, and I wrote about my mother too, who has, who, um, she passed away. Um, but we had, she had a long bout of dementia and it just, um, what you're writing just really, you know, resonates with me as well. So, um, and, and that, like you're saying, and pulling us down to the, um, you know, we, we work on all these, you know, heady, lofty, you know issues as peacemakers but you know really grounding us in in what it the the work that really needs to be done which is which is one-on-one -on -one with each other it's just um just so wonderfully centering and 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 such a blessing so so thank you um <laughs> but i i'm 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 here i'm i'm i want to invite everyone um there is a call um, at 8, 8 p.m., uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, so in about a half an hour. Um, uh, it's an effort to organize Christians um, uh, across the country to advocate for Palestinian uh, freedom, Palestinian rights, for an end, and for an end to the genocide in Gaza. So I did put it in the chat. I'll drop it in the chat again. Um, it's bit.ly. XIANS for Christians, Mass Call uh, is where you can register uh, to join. We're hoping to get as many as a thousand people to come tonight. Last I checked, there was about 1,400 people registered. So, um, so we'll see how many people actually show up on the call. But it would be great um, for those of you who haven't registered if uh, if you could pop in. Um, and if you can't if you can't be there for eight o'clock, um, and you do want to be connected. Register anyhow, <laughs> um, so that you can get connected to the movement. So, um, so I, I, like I said, I will uh, drop uh, that in the chat in uh, just a minute. Oh, Abigail. Um, hey, Kath, and everybody else. Frida, thank you so much. This is beautiful. I have my book in front of me reading along. I just wanted to say, I don't know if this is exactly kosher, but I had just gotten an email with the link to the call. So I just put that into the uh, chat. So it's the actual... I, I don't think it's specific to me. So that's the actual link if people just want to take that. Uh, no, actually, Abigail, usually that the way that works is it will be specific to you. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure, but yeah. so it was a people, try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so actually, so I, I would encourage you to actually register yourself and I will I will drop it in the chat right now. Um, and, and I'm going to turn it over to John. All right. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, no worries. The towel was delivered to the baby bathroom for bedtime. So uh, things are moving. Um, well, I am usually the person, some of you may know me from Pox Christi USA. 
as the person who, after there is uh, compelling talk about justice and uh, strong anti-capitalist discourse, uh, comes on and asks you to give five bucks. Um, so uh, uh, usually I am asking folks to give uh, to Fox Christie USA. Um, tonight, I'm asking folks, uh, largely because if you are here and you do have Frida's wonderful book, there's a chance you already do give to Pox Christie USA. Um, I'm asking folks tonight, though, if they will make a donation uh, to the Daniel Berrigan Collective. Um, the Daniel Berrigan Collective is the organization um, that makes uh, events uh, like this happen. We really see ourselves uh, as a convening space um, to bring together uh luminaries and great thinkers uh, like Frida, um, who uh, move with us in particular moments, who hold a little piece of the present with us, um, and who, like Frida, remind us of the fasts that matter and the things that matter in our world. So um, we, I will put another link in the chat here. Um, this is our Ko-Fi or coffee. I don't actually know how to pronounce it, um, where if you want to uh, get, throw a couple bucks our way, uh, if you want to make a monthly donation or a one-time donation, uh, it lets us keep bringing speakers like Frida back. Um, so we're very, very grateful um, to all of you. I'm grateful for you being with us here tonight. Um, I'll put that link in the chat one more time. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. And, uh, and thank you, Frida. Uh, it's really been a, been a gift to... Uh, Hear your words, the written words, but also the the words from your heart that call us to call us to the gospel in this season. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a great gift to you are. Thank you. Um, I think we're at an end uh, for this evening. Uh, uh, people can register. Uh, Contributions, as John says, are welcome. Uh, we don't really have a budget at uh, uh, the Daniel Berrigan Collective. It's totally a labor of love, but we do like to provide our speakers and contributors with uh, a little honorarium, and that's what we're really what we're looking for here. So, thanks to all who are on. Um, we'll let you know. Uh, when the next webinar is in the works and uh, blessing all blessings of Lent. Thank you, Frida.